Thank you all for coming. I'm uh, Professor Michael Freeman. I've uh, wanted to make the convenience of the conference to which this lecture is appended. I'm very sorry to tell you that Baroness Hale uh, has informed us only a few minutes ago that she's not well enough to come and chair the lecture, so I shall be chairing it instead of her. We wouldn't have this conference or the, this lecture were, were it not for our support and our sponsors, and you'll see on the board some of them are mentioned. But let me add to that Laura Divine solicitors who've been very kindly offering us a sum of money which has helped us to get George, J uh, James Orbinski here, in fact. It's a privilege and a great pleasure to be able to introduce him to you. Uh, uh, he is a professor at the University of Toronto, but he's much more than that. He's had numerous uh, awards, including when he worked for Medicine Sans Frontier, he was the laureate recipient uh, of, no, of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, so it's indeed a pleasure to be able to introduce someone uh, who has attained that kind of status. His, uh, might as well give him a plug for his book. Is it <laughs> an sure, go ahead. <laughs> if, you, if you want to read about the things for which he got the Nobel Peace Prize, an imperfect offering, dispatches from the medical front line, is, is an exceptionally fine read and well worth, uh, well worth getting. Uh, for those of you who are at the conference, it's on sale at the, uh, one of the desks in the conference, but worth getting anywhere for, for those who can't get it from there. Well, you haven't come here to listen to me. You've come here to listen to James Orbinski, quite rightly, so I'll hand over to him to give his lecture. That's great. Uh, well, thank you, Michael. Uh, for a very kind introduction, and I do have to make one slight correction. Uh, it was Médecins Sans Frontières that uh, actually received the Nobel Peace Prize. I, as president, accepted the prize on behalf of the organization, but I think it's very important, very clear about that. But that said, um, it's a very kind introduction. I appreciate it very much. And I'd like to thank, uh, as well, uh, you, Michael, uh, and Professor Hawks and Bennett uh, for having invited me uh, to uh, participate in this uh, legal issues uh, colloquium. Um, which uh, has brought together really some of the most uh, formidable, or at least apparently formidable, uh, leading uh, scholars uh, from a multidisciplinary perspective uh, to grapple with questions around global health and to seek uh, innovative solutions. It's also a pleasure uh, for me to um, be here, particularly in the company of, of some of my uh, colleagues, uh, both current and past, and Nathan Ford, for example, from uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, one of the key intellectual, if you will, powerhouses within Médecins Sans Frontières that was part of the Access to Essential Medicines campaign. Uh, and also Trudeau Lemons from University of Toronto, one of the key uh, international legal scholars uh, dealing with uh, issues uh, around uh, uh, pursuit of justice, pursuit of equity, and, uh, and its relationship to health. And of course, Kent uh, Buse, uh, who uh, has uh, and continues to have a significant uh, role uh, to play um, in the formulation of governance issues around the WHO. So it's very much a pleasure uh, for me to be here. Uh, and um, I'm going to try to discuss uh, uh, something that I actually, uh, uh, based on the evidence today, the expertise that's been presented by legal scholars uh, and others who clearly know a lot about global health and law, I'm going to try to uh, uh, talk about something that I know actually even less about, uh, which is uh, global health uh, law and justice. And um, I hope that that won't put you off uh, from what I'm about to discuss. Now, I've worked uh, as a humanitarian doctor uh, in many different situations uh, over the course of my career. I've worked in famine, I've worked in war, I've worked in situations of epidemic disease, uh, and I've also worked in situation, in the very particular situation of genocide. Uh, all of which are uh, catastrophic uh, human events and apparently hopeless human events. And this gives me a very particular uh, perspective and one that uh, 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 has helped me learn uh, that human suffering does not take place in a political vacuum uh, or without very specific causes uh, and conditions. And global health, <coughs> excuse me, is not simply a humanitarian question or, or simply one of seeing the dignity of the other and acting for, uh, toward the immediate relief of human suffering. It was uh, Immanuel Kant 
who wrote in his Metaphysics of Morals that, quote, humanity in his person is the object of the respect which he can demand from every other human being. Now, Kant's humanity uh, in his person is the basis for our conception of dignity, uh, which underlies our human rights conceptions uh, and our human rights law. But does this make it true that all human beings have certain rights simply by virtue of being human? Well, sometimes. Uh, but in practice, not always. But the possibility exists. And law, and most especially its formulation and its prescription, can make this possibility true. Now, global health and law are intimately tied to national uh, and global governance, to institutions like the WTO and their concrete practices around, for example, trade law and access to medicines. They're intimately tied to concepts and to practices around health and security, to governance of communicable diseases through, for example, the international health regulations, and the governance of non-communicable diseases through, for example, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. The global health and law uh, is also intimately tied to international humanitarian law, and most especially in war, and to human rights law, uh, in, for example, grappling with the HIV-AIDS uh, pandemic. And yes, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control uh, is a significant achievement in global health law. And this is despite the self-interest and the very real power of the tobacco industry, which made its best efforts to conceal, to distort, and to manipulate the evidence that tobacco causes many forms of cancer. And so too are the new international health regulations, a significant achievement in global health law. And this, despite the efforts of states such as China and Canada, that sought to protect their domestic economies uh, as a matter of priority over any alleged risk that may have existed because of SARS. But all of this, I think, uh, should be uh, self-evident. More importantly, what is not self-evident is the process which uh, binds law and global health and the ends to which that process aims. It is this that I would like to explore, at least in some minor detail, uh, this evening. Now, our conceptions of global health have not caught up with the global political challenges that we face. Thinking around global health is too often still caught in what I call a techno-charity mindset, uh, one uh, that does not easily see beyond the desire to do good, uh, to actually critically examine and engage the political realities of making real this good intention. So to be clear, good intentions are just simply not good enough in themselves to bring us to the next step in developing a framework of law that both enables and governs the achievement of global health. Now global health, in my view, in its broadest conception, connotes a well-being in a state of justice. Now these are decidedly universalist claims and ends. And if global health is to be something other than an ideal beyond our grasp, then it requires a framework that's rooted in fact, in law, and a common sense of morality. Now this framework is typically called politics and both contains and shapes the plural forces, the plural factors, and the plural actors that define the content of politics and the outcomes of politics. And with every respect to Jeremy uh, Bentham of this college, who, as I understand, Michael, uh, may be present but actually can't vote, uh, <coughs> law is not simply made uh, in positivist uh, in the positivist doings of Aristotle's tripartite divisions of, ex of executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Rather, 
as a great legal scholar, a great international uh, legal, uh, international, a uh, great scholar of international law, Harold Laswell argued, and I think quite correctly, lawmaking is a process of communication in which policy content, authority, and control intention are modulated to both create and sustain expectations. Now this is an inherently imperfect and ongoing political process. The pursuit of global health is also a deeply political and a deeply imperfect process. And yet I am hopeful, in fact deeply hopeful, and particularly about the power of law, as it can, about the power of law as it is and as it can be, and most especially about the communicative stories and values that law can both capture and sustain. Albeit incrementally, these literally can change the world. But how quickly? Well, today, we are in the midst of converging global crises in food, in fuel, in climate, economy, and governance. And each of these crises have both local and global causes. They're interdependent, and as we know all too clearly, have highly contagious global consequences. We are at a moment in our human story where we must squarely face the unavoidable complexity, interdependency, and fragility of our human condition. We have literally become our own geological epoch, the Anthropocene, where human pressures on the planet are at risk of triggering abrupt and irreversible changes with potentially catastrophic outcomes for human societies. We have already crossed three of nine planetary boundaries or tipping points and risk triggering nonlinear, abrupt environmental change with uh, continental and, uh, and planetary consequences uh, for our biosphere. As crises converge and literally ramify in unexpected, unpredictable ways, policy spheres can no longer be distinct. Now, the microbiologist Louis Pasteur said some 150 years ago that the microbe is nothing, it's terrain, everything. The implications of this context for global health are staggering, to say, to say the least. And the question that I ask is, are these matters of misfortune or are they matters of justice? If it is true, as, as Judith uh, Schlar wrote, that civilization advances when what is commonly perceived as misfortune becomes considered an injustice, then global health is far more than a technical domain of knowledge, primarily aimed at reducing avoidable morbidity and mortality. In my view, global health is public health writ large. It is about the pursuit of better health for all. And it is necessarily about the pursuit of justice. And this necessarily involves law. There is, of course, a distinction between law and justice. And justice, in its original meaning of justicia, is one of the four cardinal virtues on which the well-being of a civilized society hinges. Now, Catherine Liu, who is a political philosopher at McGill University, argues that justice is the hallmark of human society and that like all virtues and vices, it is particular to humanity. While we may uh, metaphorically use the language of justice to define uh, acts of the gods or fate or nature, in the end, it is only human beings who can be just or unjust. She says that justice is an ideal which requires no superhuman effort for its attainment, but that cannot be affected without human will or human effort. 
and these are most lacking when injustice is done. Now, despite the limits of law, it's sometimes the mere possibility of justice that is the only source of hope for so many. And that possibility is sometimes expressed in the stories, our human stories, that can give birth to pragmatic action and sometimes to law that, that both enables and protects that action. I put it to you that, that the stories that law can contain, the stories that law can reflect, or the stories that law can derive from, and their communicative power are central to this advance from misfortune uh, to justice. And that story is most powerful when the high ideals of humanity, compassion, common morality, and the notion of the common good are absolutely overtly and explicitly among its key themes. Stories matter, and they matter a lot. And as human beings, we all have stories. As with justice, nature does not tell stories. We do. We find ourselves in them, we choose ourselves in them, and we make ourselves in them. And stories can be revolutionary. And they can show that hope is not a fool's choice. Now, in Rwanda, in 1994, I was Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors of the Borders, head of mission in Kigali, which is the country's capital city. And I was there as a humanitarian doctor. And it was a place with a very particular politics. It was the criminal politics of genocide. And it was a brutal, horrible time. A place of rational and state-planned evil. Over a million people, virtually all of them Tutsis, were butchered to death in 14 short weeks. Now, bodies literally filled the streets of the capital city. And the gutters alongside a hospital that we managed to keep open those gutters literally ran red with human blood. Now one night, after many long hours of surgery, a little girl of about nine told me how she escaped murder at the hands of the Indrahamway killing squads. And through an interpreter, the little girl told me, and I quote, my mother hid me in the latrine. I saw through the hole. I watched them hit her with machetes and I watched my mother's arm fall into my father's blood on the floor, and I cried without noise in the toilet. Now, throughout that country, parents often paid to have their own children shot in open pit latrines, rather than to see their children, excuse me, murdered by being hacked to death with a machete. Now, for years before the genocide, the French government trained and armed Rwandan soldiers. And all the way through the genocide, the French government supplied them with arms, with mercenaries, and with military intelligence. Doctors Without Borders and others repeatedly called for UN military intervention. But the international community, including my own country, Canada, failed to act. And Belgium, France, and the United States actively worked to paralyze the United Nations Security Council, which abandoned the UN peacekeeping force that was already on the ground. Now, each of these countries knowingly pursued their foreign policies through genocide. The genocide was politics as we can choose to live it. But is that the end of the story? Well, how do you have hope in the face of genocide? How do you see possibility? Well, it does not lie in naive utopian dreams. It lies in what we actually do. 
Now, Hannah Arendt was one of the greatest political philosophers of the 20th century, and she was a Jew who, as a young woman, escaped the Nazi Reich to France and then to New York. And she said, after many long years as an academic trying to understand how was it possible that within the great political tradition, a 2,000 year tradition of Western political thought and practice, how was it possible that that tradition could give birth to the two great totalitarianisms under Stalin and under Hitler? She said, after much and many years of deliberation, she said, quote, the first political act is to speak. Now many have described genocide and similar human cruelties as unspeakable, but they are as unspeakable as they are undoable. As human beings, we do genocide, and doctors cannot stop this crime. The little girl that I told you about, she had no voice, but we had a responsibility to speak out against what we knew, and we did speak. We spoke with a clear intent to rouse the outrage of public opinion and co public consciousness around the world and to demand a politics that pursues justice by putting the dignity of the victim at its center. Now, 18 years ago, when the genocide ended in Rwanda, there was no such thing as an international criminal court. In 2002, the ICC came into being, and it has since issued many arrest warrants for alleged war criminals and has had several significant convictions. Three years ago, it issued an arrest warrant for Mr. Omar al-Bashir, the president and sitting head of state uh, for Sudan, and he is charged with intentionally directing attacks against civilians in Darfur, with pillage, with murder, with extermination, with forcible transfer of civilians, with torture, and with the use of rape as a weapon of war. The creation of the International Criminal Court, ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, is a seminal, and I mean that word very precisely, is a seminal and imperfect human achievement. Now, for the first time in human history, those individuals who violate the laws of war can be held to account if their own governments fail to hold them to such account. Now the ICC emerged because of the outrage of citizens like you and me who listened to what was spoken by organizations like Médecins Sans Frontières, Oxfam, Amnesty International, and thousands of others in, uh, who met in churches, in schools, in community clubs, and on university campuses like this University College London, and who met around the world. They acted and they organized, bringing together academics, jurists, and some of the best political and legal minds in the world. The ideas of an apparently obscure prepar preparatory committee that had been working in the margins for years suddenly became relevant offering core and central policy content to the process of the creation of the International Criminal Court. They focused their mind, their time, and their energy. They engaged in debate and policy analysis, and they explored alternatives in that messy and imperfect process that we call politics. All spoke, listened, and demanded a better politics. And they sought out courageous politicians, who came to the point where it was impossible to ignore the voices and the choices of citizens. Against all odds, against all naysayers, and against all pessimists, as human beings, we invented the International Criminal Court. And now, even with its current imperfections that must be corrected, including the fact that China, India, Russia, and the United States have not yet signed its statutes, it is absolutely clear that no one, not even a sitting head of state, can claim to be above the law. Now the first act of justice, in my view, is actually very simple. 
It's recognizing the victim. In January of 2000, I was in South Africa at an MSF uh, AIDS uh, clinic, and I was examining a 20-year-old man, and if you were here in London or virtually anywhere else in the Western world, he would be just starting his life. But there, his life was nearly over. He had AIDS, and he weighed less than 100 pounds. Now, patented drugs to treat AIDS were available in the Western world, but at a cost of more than 13,000 US dollars a year uh, for treatment, there wasn't a hope in hell that he or virtually anyone uh, in the developing world would get access to those drugs. The young man had AIDS, <coughs> and he had an AIDS-related pneumonia, and he was so weak that his mother and his grandmother had to help him up onto the examining table. And as he sat there gasping for air, he asked me some very simple questions, questions that get to the heart of inequity around the HIV-AIDS uh, epidemic. He asked me, and I quote, why do you come here with only kindness when what I need is medicine to stop this AIDS? Your kindness is good, but it will not help this AIDS. They have such medicines in your countries. Why not here in South Africa for people like me? Now, as you know, AIDS is a fully treatable uh, disease. It's as treatable as diabetes. And yet today, uh, 28 million people have died of the disease worldwide and over 33 million people live today with HIV infection, and under current global uh, uh, infection rates, at least an additional 24 million people uh, will be infected by 2020. And almost all of those people, 97% of those people, are in the developing world. Now, how do you have hope in the face of an epidemic like AIDS? How do you see possibility when charity uh, is simply not good enough? Well, at that clinic in South Africa, in a public act of civil disobedience, MSF, together with Treatment Access Campaign, was about to begin treatment by publicly and illegally importing AIDS drugs into South Africa. It was literally in listening and in seeing the dignity of people like this young South African man that MSF began its uh, Access to Essential Medicines campaign. And as then president of MSF, I had the privilege of launching that campaign. That campaign was and remains a challenge to a failing politics. We acted and we were not alone. It was a similar process that, that others had used to create the ICC. As one among many actors, we established a plural grounding in multiple processes. We brought together some of the best uh, like-minded, scientific, business, political, and legal scholars and practitioners in the world. We focused our mind, our time, and our energy. We applied rigorous policy analysis and debated the meaning and the limits of the law. We engaged in pragmatic action to challenge law and test its applications. In this case, compulsory licensing and parallel importation provisions of the TRIPS agreement which were designed, in theory, uh, to protect the public good. We explored alternatives uh, while simultaneously beginning treatment programs in the developing world to show that not only uh, that we believe that all people have a right uh, to treatment, but to show that treatment is possible even when health infrastructure is a little less than dismal. We mobilized a coalition of citizens groups from around the world and we mounted a global campaign uh, that publicly shamed pharmaceutical companies and governments that supported the privilege of profit over people's right to exist as human beings. And we stood up to the challenge of the pharmaceutical industry <coughs> in South African uh, courts, and we challenged them in the court of public opinion. This litigation in South Africa was not an endpoint uh, um, that uh, we saw or uh, as the final moment to increase access to antiretrovirals. But it was a critical communicative act that challenged the moral legitimacy of the law as it was being then interpreted in South Africa. And hours before the case was to be heard in the court, the pharmaceutical industry dropped the case because of the enormous weight of global public opinion. We also pooled our purchasing power 
and bought generic versions of AIDS drugs. By 2001, we had brought the market price for the treatment of AIDS down from 13,000 US dollars for patented versions uh, of the medications to less than $200 for generic versions of exactly the same drugs. And today, that cost is less than 64 US dollars for generic versions of antiretrovirals. And again, against all odds, against all naysayers, and against all fatalists who, who dismissed apparent misfortune as a consequence of human nature, there are today more than six million people on, the, on full treatment for HIV in the developing world. And despite the most dire of predictions, the pharmaceutical industry did not collapse. <laughs> now the problem that we were confronting was not only about access to uh, existing drugs for AIDS. Some 15 million people uh, still die every year from largely treatable uh, or neglected diseases. And over a billion people suffer from neglected tropical diseases for which there's virtually no drug R&D. The problem, in the simplest of terms, is that the needs of poor people, who by definition have very little purchasing power, do not translate into a return on investment for pharmaceutical corporations. This is both a failure of the market and a failure of public policy. And again, it was a similar process in confronting this issue. We brought together academics from the best scientific, business, political, and, uh, and legal communities in the world. They focused their mind, their time, and their energy. They applied rigorous analysis, explored alternatives, and experimented with options. We created the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative which is a not-for-profit uh, uh, drug development company. The DNDI was launched in 2003, and its first drug, a fixed-dose combination antimalarial, was released in partnership with a private company, Sanofi Aventis, and it was released in March of 2007. A second fixed-dose combination antimalarial was released uh, in 2008. A new treatment for African sleeping sickness was released last year, among a total thus far of six new treatments that are now available for neglected tropical diseases. And the DNDI has 17 other compounds uh, under development. Again, how did this happen? Well, in the first instance, we saw the dignity of our patients. We refused to accept the unacceptable. We saw a possibility. And against all naysayers, we acted to create an alternative. With rigorous attention to governance, the board of the DNDI is made up of exclusively public sector institutions and Médecins Sans Frontières, all committed by statute to the public good, and uh, by which it uses, uh, in a very creative manner, intellectual uh, property rights law, for example, through uh, sublicensing agreements to achieve concrete and meaningful uh, outcomes. DNDI demonstrates that real alternatives are, in fact, uh, possible. Now, like the International Criminal Court process, both the campaign and the DNDI, together with others, have also engaged in the communicative process of creating, and enabling, uh, of creating the enabling circumstances for relevant law to emerge. Ten years ago, both uh, the DNDI and the campaign created a rationale and continued to push for the WHO to create a commission on the impact of intellectual property rights on public health globally. At the same time, both explored and pushed for the emergence of the concept and practice of patent pooling. The most recent May 2012 World Health Assembly uh, uh, meeting passed a resolution in favor now of a framework for global health R&D, very much a consequence of the enabling environment that uh, initiatives by the campaign and the, D and the DNDI had engaged over 10 years ago and continued to engage over that 10-year period. Both the campaign and DNDI and other initiatives like it have changed global health and our conception of what is possible forever. Now, Hannah Arendt also wrote that we are not born equal, that equality 
and equity are the result of choice and of human organization. And yet for billions of people today, the lack of equity is a politically determined choice. Today in Canada, for example, in the United States, life expectancy is 81 years and growing. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, average life expectancy is 46 years and falling. In our world of 7 billion people, 3.8 billion, or more than half of all of the people on the planet, live on less than two US dollars a day. Now in 2009, more than 100 million people were added to the already 900 million people, one in seven on the planet, who now go to bed hungry every single night. In 2008, hungry people deposed the Prime Minister of Haiti, and that was a year before the devastating earthquake. In 2008, hungry people also rioted in at least 60 countries around the world. And the director of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, Mr. Jacques Zieff, he said at that time, 1,000 million <coughs> bellies. They accuse us and they shame us and are a threat to world peace and security. Now he's right on all counts. And this is our world today. And for more than half of us on the planet, daily life truly is nasty, brutish, and short. Now a few months ago, I was back in Malawi with Dignitas International, which is a new organization that I and another Canadian, uh, James Fraser, started in 2008. The organization is focused on creating an alternative model of uh, care for HIV AIDS, uh, and also an alternative model that can incorporate tuberculosis and care for non-communicable diseases using primary health care uh, for people in the developing world. Why primary health care? Well, because by working with the Ministry of Health and supporting people uh, with HIV, with TB, and other primary health care needs, individuals and their communities can face their health needs on their own terms. And we've trained hundreds of nurses, of clinical officers, of doctors, of community health workers, and home-based care volunteers. And we're supporting women's groups, groups of orphans, and groups of people living with HIV. And we now have more than 20,000 children, women, and men on full treatment for AIDS in Malawi, and thousands more HIV-positive people under our medical care. <coughs> and we published what is recognized as some of the best HIV research in the world. And our pilot program is so successful that this year, we're scaling up to offer the program to a population base of three million people in Malawi. Now, eight short years ago, when we started this organization inside my own home hospital in Toronto, at St. Michael's Hospital at the University of Toronto, eight years ago, entire villages in Malawi had collapsed in the despair and the hopelessness of rampant disease. 90% of hospital admissions were HIV positive, and people literally languished and died uh, in the shade of the trees surrounding the hospital. That was the image on the first day that I arrived uh, and that we arrived in, in, in Zamba uh, to start uh, this program. And now, villages are back at work and people's primary concern, as it should be, is the education of their children. Now that said, riots across Malawi this past July left 18 people dead as people demanded better governance in the management of currency exchange rates, and in the face of rising fuel and food costs and food shortages. Now why is this happening? Well, the most immediate or proximate cause is the ongoing effects of the international financial crisis. Donor dollars have plummeted, currency valuations have fluctuated more up than down, and uh, fuel and food commodity prices have fluctuated more uh, up than down creating political instability, and with it, massive civil society protests, and with that, a new president. But just behind this immediate, proximate economic cause is the reality of what the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization 
recognizes as a pattern of severe and prolonged droughts that could become permanent due to climate change. Now climate change, or what I prefer to identify as global warming, is also a critical factor in the famine that last year left 13 million people at risk in Somalia and the Greater Horn of Africa, and that today threatens the Sahal region of uh, uh, Africa. Now a mere 10 years from now, crop yields in some parts of the continent of Africa are expected to drop by 50%, and water stress could affect as many as 250 million Africans. Now exactly the same process is true for Central America and for Southeast Asia. There is absolutely no amount of humanitarian assistance as we organize it today that can cope humanely and equitably with such massive need. In North America, West Nile virus, never before seen before the year 2000, has infected more than 21,000 and killed more than 800 people in the United States and Canada. The Canadian government has warned that the country might eventually experience yellow fever and malaria. Lyme disease has moved up north through the United States and dengue fever is following, all because of global warming. And indeed, the Lancet has recognized that global warming, or climate change as it calls it, is the greatest global health threat of the 21st century. We come full circle when we realize that in Darfur, Sudan, it is global warming that drives competition for access to water and arable land, and that, leaves, and that leads today to war crimes, to crimes against humanity, and to what I describe as uh, slow motion genocide. Now simply letting, quote, simply letting climate change rip and tidying up the damage <coughs> as it occurs is not an enviable strategy. Excuse me. <clears throat> let, me give you, <coughs> let me give you that quote again. Simply letting climate change rip and tidying up the damage as it occurs <coughs> is not an, envi an enviable strategy. Continuing the quote, in poor countries, higher temperatures will mean an increased risk of hardship and societal collapse, and, ri <coughs> and rich countries will be forced to respond. Now that is not a quote by me. That's from the editorial in today's Financial Times, uh, which uh, is, uh, uh, infamously publishes under the tagline, without fear and without favor. Now global warming, ladies and gentlemen, is a matter of justice. Its health effects and implications have had little attention from climate scientists and governments. And if there's fault here, there is absolute failure among those who are concerned with global health. A failure thus far to engage a communicative process around global warming that includes pragmatic action and that can shape the emergence of both practice uh, and law. Now last month, Jerome Singh from the U uh, University of KwaZulu-Natal uh, in Durban, uh, has very correctly argued that human health and health ethics considerations must be core and not a peripheral focus and must be given equal status to economic considerations in future climate change deliberations. And further, that the health community, led by health ministers and the World Health Organization, absolutely must play a central role in future climate change delib deliberations. <coughs> Now before I close, let me note that I've told you a series of stories of engaging the world as it is, so as to shape it as to what it can be. Each of the challenges that I've touched on are complex, are fed by interdependent crises, are both local and global in their causality and their scope, and are without a doubt formidable. And yet I know, and I think I've demonstrated, that as human beings, we are capable of extraordinary and yet always imperfect outcomes. Whether it's justice in the face of genocide, equitable access to life-saving medicines, new research for neglected diseases, addressing hunger, 
or the ongoing and new challenges facing the AIDS community, primary health care, or climate change. The right kind of change is, in fact, possible. And law, as a communicative process, can be and is absolutely central. The Jolly Initiative, or the Jolly Initiative, the Joint Action and Learning Initiative on National and Global Responsibilities for Health, is a potentially powerful initiative that seeks health for all, and in its own words, justice for all. Now, some of you may be familiar with the great jurist, legal, legal jurist, Koskinini. And in his book, titled, the Gent uh, titled International Law, The Gentle Civilizer of Nations, he cautioned against an excessive positivism or instrumentalism. My sense is that the Jolly Initiative has taken this very much to heart and is open to law as a communicative process. And hopefully, it will avoid the pitfalls that have beset the uh, non-communicable diseases initiative. Here, for example, despite ample data uh, evidencing the need for such a NCD framework, as in a quote-unquote elites initiative, the NCD initiative lacks a dialogic, top-down, bottom-up communicative process, as well as a coherent, unifying clarion call. Now, in contrast, Jolly, the Jolly Initiative, in my view, is full of possibility. Now, how does one see possibility? Well, as I said earlier, it does not lie in naive utopian dreams. It lies in what we actually do. The most innovative and politically transformative ideas, ideas in the pursuit of justice of the last 200 years, have been driven by engaged citizens who acted, however imperfectly, to explore and create alternatives. The abolition of the slave trade, the emergence of labor, children's and women's rights, civil rights for African Americans, reform of the post-World War II and post-Cold War rules of war, the environmental movement, the global health movement, some of which I've told you about this evening, are each examples of transformative ideas that are rooted in the notion of justice. These have led <coughs> not to law that has been created simply through self-evident necessity, but rather law that has emerged and is constantly emerging in a long time, ongoing, imperfect process and context of evidence gathering, political engagement, contestation, and confrontations of power in pursuit of justice. Each began as an apparently lost cause, and however imperfectly, has achieved practical outcomes that surpass those of the prior world. The law can be, and now often is, central to such transformations. Here, to be effective, as another great international uh, legal scholar, Michael Reisman, described in an elaboration of Laswell, to be effective, law must be a communicative process that inculcates itself as a normative standard by which sustaining intentions and tensions within a polity can be guided so that law contributes optimally to human dignity. The legal authority of, for example, the ICC itself or its trials, their control intention and their policy content are three strands of what Reisman would describe as a coaxial cable that both harnesses and contains these intentions and tensions. The normative communicative processes entails an ongoing redefinition or reshaping of the community's constitutive principles and objectives. And this makes the wrong of, for example, genocide both publicly and privately acknowledged for both perpetrator and victim. Now, Edmund Burke said that society is a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. 
I hope that over the last 45 minutes or so, that I've argued that global health in its broadest conceptualization connotes well-being in a state of justice. I hope I've shown that the use and construction of law as a communicative process is central to reducing injustice and enhancing global health. And I hope that I've also shown that global health law is most effective when it has a plural grounding in pragmatism, the, the high ideals of humanity, human rights, and the pursuit of the public good. I have argued for a conception of law in relation to global health that is beyond positivism, which holds that law is only made by the legislature, to one that sees law as most powerful when it is a function of a communicative process over time that at least allows the possibility, but never the certainty, of justice. Thank you very much. You've just listened to a man of whom we can all be very proud and to a lecture that was both powerful and erudite uh, and highly significant. It was harrowing in parts, shaming in parts, moving in parts, and challenging throughout. Since Hannah Arendt was quoted on a couple of occasions, let me remind people here, I say, I say that in a strange way because I'm sure you won't know the exact page, but I think it's on page 227 of The Origins of Totalitarianism. <laughs> and I knew I was chairing the lecture five minutes before it started. That Hannah Arendt actually argues that the most important right that anybody has got is the right to have rights. That is one of the things that, of course, genocide throughout the 20th century and the early 21st century has denied. Can I say, because I think it may tell you something not about me, but about the society I was living in at the time, that during the Rwandan massacre and genocide, I was barely aware of it, even though I'm someone who reads the newspapers regularly. I was living in Wisconsin at the time, and the local newspaper in there did not have anything of any significance on the Rwandan crisis or genocide at all. It was only when I came home for a weekend to London and picked up the Sunday Times or the Observer, I can't remember which it was, that I realized what was going on. Uh, it, it's hardly surprising that American society doesn't react in the way in which it should to such crises and to such genocide when the population is probably kept in an illusion of ignorance throughout. Thank you very much. It was a quite outstanding lecture. I attend lectures in this room at least once a fortnight, and I can't remember one which has moved me more than the one we've just listened to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael.